Good morning, Mr. Hausman. I see you're checking in. I'll just need a credit card with a rather large balance on it to cover any unforeseen incidentals of our services that you probably won't use anyway. Yeah, sure, no problem. You could put some on this card, maybe a little bit on this card, maybe a little bit on that card. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, and I got this great Starbucks card here. I think I got 89 cents on it you could use. And of course, I've got this great gift certificate my mom gave me in 1979. It's from Record World. Do you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast with me, your host, Glenn Hausman. I am excited to have you here today. We are deep in May, and boy, oh boy, is it great to enjoy spring out there and to to be out and about. And the good thing is I'm home now for the next few weeks. I'm very excited to be here. I can get that backyard in in shape and really get the uh, the Hausman Resort Pool Club and Smokehouse all in in shape for the uh, the summer season. I'm excited about that. But more importantly, if you are not subscribing to our weekly newsletter, text the word HOTEL to 66866. That's the word HOTEL to 66866, and you will get our Sunday night newsletter. Because in addition to these podcasts, we got a lot of great videos that we're, we're putting out there, and I'd like you to be able to see each and every one of them. And of course, a huge thanks to my good friends over at Duetto, the revenue strategy technology platform that thousands of hotels are using to make more money. They are helping support me. I really want you to help support them. And you can do that in two two different ways. Check out my um, interview with their CEO, Patrick Bosworth, which you can find on the homepage of the NoVacancyNews.com site, all about how you can use revenue strategy to your best advantage. And check out GetRevenueResults.com. That's GetRevenueResults.com. And also on the website, you could check, uh, just click the Duetto ad and you could get a, uh, a great white paper, Blueprint for Taking Back Business from the OTAs. I know all of you hotel-minded folks out there are going to love that one. And also, you know what? It's springtime. If you're feeling kind of generous, uh, either give me uh, five stars on iTunes over there. Just go to uh, iTunes. Go to No Vacancy Podcast. Click on that five stars rating. I could really use that. It helps me. It makes me feel good about myself. It makes me feel like I'm doing something here for each and every one of you out there. Um, and speaking of doing stuff uh, for, for me, I want to do stuff for you today, which is why I have with me uh, a really cool guest. His name is Anthony Bennett. He founded the company Red Sky Strategy, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the issues that he's seeing right now on how he can help you guys exceed in your business. Uh, so, Anthony, hey, welcome aboard, man. Hey, Glenn. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you so much for uh, sitting there patiently while I was doing uh, the, the whole spiel there uh, this morning. I know um, I know you probably, once I started talking about the smokehouse and, and stuff, you started dreaming about coming out here for, for ribs. But, uh, I'm, I I'm, did. I'm, I, I did. I'm sorry. It's not quite rib season yet, but we will be there very shortly. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have you out. So, um, uh, you know, I'd like, I think a great place to start is um, explaining a little bit about what Red Sky strategy is. So that way, when we get into some of these issues, people could know that you are indeed the real deal sure so again thank you for having me um sure. so we're a marketing consulting company um and we focus on basically three elements we focus on really strategy development branding development and innovation helping our clients innovate right. uh, new products and innovation processes hmm. oh. um and go ahead uh, no, I was gonna. You, you, when you said innovation, um, new processes, it immediately got me thinking. Uh, how do you create? Um, how do you set the stage for smart innovation with in, in a company? Because I could sit here and tell myself I'm innovating, but how do I actually know um, I'm doing that? And how can I make sure that we're uh, we're doing that right? So, innovation is kind of an art and a science, and uh, you know, I would hate to say that there's really one right way there's lots of wrong ways uh i can tell you that there are definitely wrong ways to do it Mm -hmm. um but definitely there are some ways that we're seeing that uh some hotel companies are doing it that is super smart um Mm -hmm. so i'd love to talk about some of those that we're seeing well let's do it i love Uh, i I love how you segued right into the topic very uh very good move since i'm apparently all over the place today dreaming of a barbecue and backyard so uh tell me a little bit about that 
Yeah, well, that's something we're very passionate about um, because, you know, today you can't just sit still, right? You have to keep moving forward very, very quickly because your competitors are going to move forward very, very quickly. So if you're just sort of staying where you are, you're just going to fall more and more behind. So you have to innovate. And, um, you know, the worst way to innovate, let's say the wrong way, is to just sit with the focus group and ask them, well, what do you think we should do? And I always think back about Henry Ford's quotes. And he said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Right. Absolutely. And uh, it, it's, uh, so, I, I see that. I see that in the modern era with um, what Steve Jobs was able to do with creating the, uh, the iPod, for example, which when that came out was the most seminal piece of electronic uh, equipment that I've ever seen. I never knew I wanted it. But once it came into my life, I knew that I always needed it. So, again, if you're asking people what they think, they may not be giving you the right answers. Correct. They don't, people can't project into the future right. uh, readily. So it's up to people in business to be visionary. And so the question then is, where do you get your inspiration from? And the first thing that we're seeing is many more companies are willing to try and fail. So we call it failing forward. Right. Like uh, um, Google has a, a – a, a culture where they try to encourage failure and get it done quickly so you can move on to something that works. Precisely. Mm -hmm. And again, with the internet, uh, you know, if something is not working, you right. can change it pretty quickly. You can move things around. You can change your strategy. Of course, if you're, you know, designing a new hotel, it's not as easy. You want to be a bit more methodical, but you have to try, you have to experiment, you have to be prepared and you almost have to reward failure. Like you said with Google, if you're going to start firing people because they failed, then no one's going to try anything. If someone, um, if someone tries something and fails, but they did it in the right way and you learn from them, uh, then, you know, why not? Why not, why not right. use that and, and build on it? Um, so, so that's the first thing we're seeing is more companies are, are, are at least being prepared for failure and knowing that, if, you know, if you get three out of ten that succeed and, they, and you can hit them out the ballpark, then that's a fantastic run rate. Yeah, I think so too. I think about companies like uh, Dyson that created the, uh, a whole different way of using a, a, of creating a vacuum, right? He didn't just wake yep. up one morning and do that on the first shot. He had to fail, I think, up to like a hundred different times before he got that right. And if you don't go through that process, well, then you're never going to find that success. Correct. And it's a, you just reminded me of a story. Yeah. Um, you know, this was from Tom Watson, who was the founder of IBM. Uh -huh. And there was a story that someone in his team um, made, a, made a huge mistake uh, and it cost $20 million. And Ouch. he called a guy into the office and the guy came into the office and said, I thought he was going to get fired, right? He just wasted well, yeah. or lost $20 million. And, and Tom Watson he said, I'm, of course, I'm not going to fire you. I just paid $20 million for your education. Right. Now go out there and, and, and fix it. Um, and, and I think, you know, IBM, you know, always used to have this notion, just like Google, of really experimenting, trying, moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we're seeing, and this is really interesting um, with many hotel companies, is this idea of open innovation, right. or what I might say, distributing innovation. So don't assume that you can do everything yourself. Um, it, look, look to other organizations and other industries and see how they can help you. So a great example is Marriott created this um, entity in Europe called Testbed, uh, which is a great name. Yeah. Uh, and they use it for PR as well. And they basically invited um, lots of different um, startups and companies that were some in the hotel industry, some were not, that just to come in and, and work with them to develop products that Marriott could then use in um, in its hotels and in the US actually just last year they unveiled something called the M beta um, for Marriott in Charlotte where basically the hotel is a beta so they try all this new stuff in the hotel they prototype they invite guests to test and they invite other companies to work with them and they get feedback in real time so it's about creating these open systems for innovation that um, that they can then use, see how it's working, and without that much investment, right? Because you're inviting right. other companies in. So you don't have to do everything yourself. Look to what's going on outside in the world, mm -hmm. see how you can use them, um, and see who you can 
um, work with. The other types of people that hotels can work with are companies like Accenture. Um, you know, Accenture and Skift had this great pitch startup competition mm -hmm. um, for the travel industry. Um, so, you know, again, using that brain power and taking it and working with it is something that's um, you can move forward very, very quickly than if you just try to do everything yourself. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. As a matter of fact, um, Hilton has done something like that recently with uh, trying to design a hotel room of the future, which was um, the winner of that particular competition was unveiled last week at uh, HD Expo. And uh, my good mm -hmm. my good friend and future uh, podcast co-host Anthony Melchiori from the Travel Channel was one of the was one of the uh, the the guests uh, uh, judges on that, which is really uh, really terrific. So what they were able to do was take all of these different design teams who all worked independently then they were able to um, find best practices and be able to uh, to pick a, a winner which really helped move that design dialogue a little bit uh, more ahead than if they were just to do it all internally so love your right. point makes a lot of sense to me and plus with those kind of with those kind of competitions and entities mm -hmm. is you can learn from the failures as well yes. the ones that don't win you can go back and say well maybe if you just tweaked this or did that you know this might work and so suddenly you might have 50 ideas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that are available to you and that you can roll out very quickly. And then the third thing that we're seeing um, companies do, and this, this goes back to, um, you know, Clay Christen, Professor Clay Christensen from Harvard, where he talks about the innovator's dilemma. And he talks about how great innovations from an industry almost always come from outside the industry. Right. Because you get very locked down in the way that you do things and the way that you see the world. A great, a great um, example of this, obviously, is Airbnb, right? It wasn't started by a hotelier who right. said, let me create this. It was started by a guy who had to sleep on his friend's air mattresses because he you know, needed a job, and um, it was during the recession. Mm -hmm. So it came completely from outside the industry and you know, revolutionized things. And so what we do a lot of in our companies, because we don't just work with um, hospitality companies, we work with financial services and we work with um, healthcare organizations, is we look to see how can we cross-fertilize Interesting. Um, some of those ideas. So, for example, a simple one is wellness, right? Look at the wellness trend that's going on, how much people are interested in exercise and yoga and eating well. And look at how Western has really taken on that trend um, and programming different things for their, um, for their guests. Look at how you can, you know, if you don't want to bring your shoes and workout gear, they'll lend it to you. That's right. I think Western has, Western has really done a great job at looking at that trend and saying, we're going to own that trend. Um, and others do it, and they do it well, but Western, I think, has really stood out. Yeah, I think so, too. I also love um, uh, Even, for example, which is a brand completely dedicated towards that platform. Um, so absolutely, yeah. So they're doing some interesting things. Okay, great. So, uh, I'll be, all right, you've got to innovate, but how do you create a culture of innovation within your organization? Because we could talk about it all day, but if you're not actually um, setting the stage for that to happen, then it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. So the first thing, as I said, is you know encourage people to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds. It sounds counterintuitive, but you've got to do it. Yep. The second is um, you have to you have to have a, a, a process, and you have to have people that are actually dedicated to it. Right. Uh, you know, everyone has day jobs. Everyone is putting out fires. It's really hard to focus on innovation. And so, for most of our clients, you know, we'll see that there'll be a head of innovation or a head of R and D, um, and then people are also you also have to um, evaluate people based on new ideas. So it shouldn't just be like, did you meet profit goals or did you meet cost goals? It should be um, what new did you bring? What new ideas did you bring? Mm. Uh, and not, and not something that you would punish people on. Well, if you didn't bring a new idea, you, you know, you're not going to get a bonus. It should be, it should be a reward mechanism so that people feel comfortable just volunteering and just, you never know where a new idea might come from. It might come from, a janitor at my, you know, because those are people that see what's going on in every hotel, right? I mean, it might come from an accountant who sees that people are frustrated with a certain process. So it's not that just the head of R&D or the head of innovation should be responsible for this. It's that everyone is responsible for this and, and that if you do it in an organization, you will be rewarded for it. 
Yeah, I, I, I like that idea very much. And I mean, if the, if you can't get ideas from the people that are doing the job every single day, you're really missing out on great opportunity uh, over there. So I, I would urge everybody to, to try to ask your team for those great ideas. And then don't punish people if they have ideas that won't actually work. You need to uh, foster a creative culture within your organization to get people to volunteer the information that they think would be a good idea, even if 90% of the stuff that they say is not going to work for various reasons, that other part sure. percentage will work and you can make your business stronger and empower your employees to feel good about themselves by implementing those ideas that will become successes. Right. Like you said, it's a numbers game. Yeah. You use, Di- you use Dyson as an example. Mm-hmm. He made hundreds or thousands of prototypes. Mm-hmm. And he, and he landed up with one. And, and that one was amazing, and, and it created a whole new business for him. If you get 100 new ideas from your staff or from people, and 95 of them are bad and five are good and one is amazing, yep. boy, you're still doing really well. I, I think that's a great run rate. So it's all in numbers. You should be generating hundreds of ideas, um, implementing tens of ideas, and hopefully one of them will stick. But if that one sticks, yep. you you know you can make millions. Yeah, just on that right? totally. And so Anthony, I've been watching this um this this older series on Amazon Prime. I finally got the uh, the password out of my wife, and I've been watching this show called uh, The Shelburne, and it's focused on a uh, a five star luxury uh, property in Ireland. Right now, mm-hmm. most of that's irrelevant except for the fact that um. They have a suggestion box in the employee dining room, and if you put in a suggestion that gets implemented, you'll win uh, a th- like a thousand, the equivalent of a thousand dollar reward or or something like that. I think that's a fun, yeah. interesting idea that motivates people to participate in a uh, a fail safe free zone. Because if the uh, the idea isn't taken, it's just uh, it's been put in the box and no one hears from it again. But if it's uh, something that's a value and merit, then that um, idea gets uh, moved forward along the uh, along the process. So you know, I think that's a great idea for hoteliers to do. Yeah, the suggestion boxes can work, as you said, if you if and only if right. you um, you offer people a, a safe environment and you and you follow up. Right, right. Mm-hmm. every idea every idea that has to come in has to someone has to say I looked at it and I rejected it or I looked at it and I'm going to do it. Otherwise, people will stop doing it. Right, but yeah. I have to say I think a, a more modern and interesting way of the suggestion box is yes. um, what some of our clients do is really hackathons. Yes. Tell me a little and bit about that. Hack- so one hackathon I attended uh, was amazing. It was for a financial services company. And um, they started off the day talking about what their goals were. And I'll talk a little bit about that, like you know, what the company stands right. for, mm-hmm. what they want to achieve, mm-hmm. uh, how they want to treat their customers. Mm-hmm. And then they, they invited people and anyone, right, um, could make a suggestion. Right. And they wrote down all the suggestions. So right. the interns everyone basically said, here's my suggestion. They had basically 60 seconds to pitch. Then what they did is they asked uh, everyone in the room, because it must have been 100, 120 people. Right. They said, all right, you choose an idea. So people voted with their feet. So everyone chose an idea. And then they were put in a group for the rest of the day to help figure out that idea. So some ideas obviously didn't get any people, and those ideas died. Right. Um, so, so the 20 ideas that made it, you know, had people working for the full day. They then had a presentation at the end of the day where the teams had to present their ideas. And the judges chose, I think, three of those. And said, all right, now we're going to give you funding. We're going to give you, you know, X thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And you have a month. Come back and, you know, flesh out your idea. And here's, your, here's the money. And come back. And so it became like a, almost like a new, a new business pitch competition. Um, all out of that one day. But the point is, it's sort of like a suggestion box. Everyone had an opportunity. No idea was right. bad. From the intern to the CEO, you all had a chance. But then the crowd voted, the company voted. You know, it went through a very quick process. So within one day, they had 20 good ideas and five great ideas. And within a month, they had at least one that was ready to be pushed out. Awesome. Wow, that's a uh, that's pretty innovative. So, how do you give your team then time over that month in order to bring that idea to uh, a fully formed state? Well, again, that's this is where senior management have to come in. It's like Google. You know, you yep. have to 
allow them so say look you, you you guys are working this for a month this is your skunk works you know here's a conference room you know spend up to 20 or 30 percent of your time cool. figuring this out right um and then of course you want to give a bit of a reward at the end right so the yeah. winning team who wins the competition gets a vacation or a bonus or something that you know can make them proud and mm-hmm. it's not about money i don't think you should always incentivize with money simply having some, a team say we won giving them a little trophy and and really celebrating them um, for what they've done, I think is almost as good as, if not better than money, because money, you know, people just go spend it. But having your photo up in the lobby saying these guys changed our changed the direction of the company, right? Um, for everyone to see is almost a better recognition, I think. Yes, I I I, I tend to agree. Although you know, a few bucks in my pocket uh, never hurts either. Absolutely, <laughs> I. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> All right. So, Anthony, you know, one of the things that uh, I've I've really noticed is, uh, and I've been saying in like my uh, my speeches on stage or when I'm moderating panels and stuff, is that all hotel companies are essentially becoming technology companies at this time. And my hunch is for for a guy like you, um, you know, over at uh, Red Sky Strategy, that uh, that the whole shift to technology is really changing brand strategies. How do you see technology yeah. affecting that going forward? Yeah, I mean, this is why it's such a fascinating industry, right? I mean, you look at just what's going on inside the hotel room um, in terms of the use of Amazon Echo or, you know, just really cool ideas of what's going on inside the hotel. But we we tend to look at sort of before that happens. So how do you get people into the hotel to experience those right. cool things? And we're seeing basically, I think, three or four really interesting trends coming up. The first is... Um, Voice. Voice is very hot at the moment. So the the Amazon Echo, you know, the, the Google Home, the, you know, Apple has come out with their own version. Um, and it's interesting because I was doing some research a few weeks ago and I, Google said that 20% of all searches are coming from voice. So if there's 11 billion searches per day. 20% already? 20%. This is Google, right? So yeah. not, they, have, they have the data. Uh, it's, not, it's not made up. So they have 11 billion searches a day on Google. That means that between two and three billion searches are being done via voice. Holy cow. It's as simple as, hey, Google, show me where the the nearest cafe is. Or, hey, Google, tell me where I can go buy this. And that's a really important point because, you know, when you go into Google and um, you and I, you know you were talking about the Shelburne, uh, and I quickly mm-hmm. just Googled Shelburne yep. Island, right? And yep. Two words. But if I was talking to Siri or I was talking to Alexa, I wouldn't say Shelburne, Dublin, right? She doesn't know. Right. So you would have to say, Siri, tell me, you know, what's a good business hotel in New York? Siri, what's a great hotel near the financial district in New York? Siri, where's the closest Hilton to the San Francisco airport. And so you have to basically change how you think about search search, um, in what someone called long tail keyword phrases, which means it makes it difficult for your search engine people. But it's really important because if I actually just say hotels, San Francisco airport, it's going to come up with 100 hotels. But if I say the closest, Siri, where's the closest Hilton hotel to the San Francisco airport? Right. Hilton should be figuring that out and helping people find the closest Hilton hotel. So I think I think that's going to be a, a, a big change. And, 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 and of course, you know, Google, that's going to affect the algorithm. Um, mm-hmm. But that's going to be a big change in search coming up, I'd say, in the next um, six to 12 months. Right. And the other thing we're seeing, obviously, a big a hot topic is artificial intelligence. And you know, how people are using artificial intelligence um, in the form, say, of chatbots. So you're starting to see them come through in in, um, in phone calls, but more online. And I, I really love some of these chatbots. I use an uh, insurance company called Lemonade um, on my phone, and the whole process is done by a chatbot, and it takes about 90 seconds. Right. And we're, see- and we're seeing some really cool chatbots in the hotel industry, um, a great one is, I don't know if you've heard, seen it, is the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas have a chatbot named Rose. Oh, I did not and, know that. And go online and look. Rose is very sassy. Mm-hmm. She <laughs> has a sense of humor. Um, 
So, so, so you know, wait, it, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but because Cosmopolitan is such a specific, defined brand, they had one of the best. Exactly. Uh, they had one of the best advertising campaigns. Uh, the right Amazing. amount of wrong, right? So it really sets right. the tone of the experience. So the reason why I say that is because my guess is Rose being sassy fits in with that same tonality that the brand is trying to achieve. Oh, it's so funny to to interact with Rose. Mm -hmm. You know, she'll say like, you know, let me know if you want a good time. Right. <laughs> you know, or or when you check into the hotel, the front desk gives them a card and it says, "Know my secrets." Text me on this number. Right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and it's got Rose's phone number. And so Rose is always a little a little edgy, and it fits the Cosmopolitan brand perfectly. So I'm not suggesting every company needs to have uh, an edgy chatbot, but it's actually not that hard because there's companies now, there's a great company called Trillio. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. That is offering chatbots to hotels and not to, to book the hotel, but, <clears throat> but to help the hotel. So people could say, let's say I'm staying at, you know, a Sheraton, you know, in Melbourne, Australia, right. mm -hmm. and they, they uh, you know, I'm just making it up. If they have a, if they have a chatbot or, or an AI and say, well, you know, what should I do today? Um, you know, can you tell me a fun activity, you know, on near the beach? Um, you know, instead of going down to the concierge and waiting in line, you know, they can, the, the chatbot can start to, um, to really anticipate and to learn and, and to really understand what people are looking for. So because they can be trained. And I think that hotels are going to, you know, use this not just in the hotel, but um, when people are making queries before they get to the hotel um, and then really helping them, you know, plan their journeys. And I think that's a really cool thing. Um, now obviously, you need a human behind it. Right. And you need humans in case people don't want right. to talk to chatbots. Mm -hmm. But I think for many people, especially younger people, they're feeling much more comfortable. Yeah, I, I agree. So it, that makes me think of, uh, you know, we originally also we were going to talk about Marriott Hotel's reward program revamp. But yesterday, uh, Marriott announced a big deal with uh, Salesforce on an all new CRM platform that really helps with uh, with personalization. Right. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that particular deal, but how do you see that going forward and playing into essentially what you've just been explaining to us? You know, I, I, it's a, it's a topic really close to my heart mm -hmm. because this is something that every hotel should be doing. And some have been doing for years, right? Um, very, very well, um, in their own way, maybe, you know, not a sophisticated way that Marriott is doing now, but, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Right. Um, Kim, Kimpton hotels. I was on a project once. Um, and for one year I stayed at the same Kimpton hotel, for one week every month right. for, for a full year. And, uh, you know, it was in uh, La Jolla and I used to arrive and, um, you know, they used to, when I used to walk in, they would know me and they would say, I used to like room 808 and they would have room mm -hmm. 808 without me asking. And I would go up to my room and it was interesting because they have, you know, Kimpton has the raid, the mini bar. So you could always, you know, raid the mini bar. Mm -hmm. And I loved, I loved pop chips at the time. Ooh, those and are good. whenever I would, whenever I would go into my room, there would be pop chips mm -hmm. and uh, flavors of pop chip. When my colleague went in, he asked for a, a different desk chair. They would have a different desk chair for him because he had bad a bad back. Right. So Kimpton, in, in its own very seamless way, had personalized my experience in a way that just made me feel like they knew me, uh, they understood my needs, and right. were really um, were really trying hard. And I'll I'll give you another funny story mm -hmm. if you don't mind no of course um so i i was there one night and i i happened to text the general manager a question and i said and i said p.s um you ran out of pop chips today in my hotel room and she she wrote back immediately and she apologized and then three days later when i got home there was a huge box waiting for me and i'm in mean, huge and I, my wife said what is this and i opened it up and it was a box just full of pop chips that they sent to my house to <laughs> apologize for running out of pop chips. And <laughs> I've told that story to hundreds of people. It must have cost them 20 bucks. Right. But, but she knew me and she like, and she, it was, and I never wanted to stay in a different hotel when I went to that area because right. they really personalized everything for me. And I think 
Nowadays, with artificial intelligence and the sales force, it's so much easier for hotels to do that. It really annoys me when I go to a hotel that I've stayed at 20 times and they ask me, is this the first time at the hotel? Absolutely. I think that's rude. It is, uh, yeah, uh, and you know, it's really just uh, they're not I get the feeling they're not even looking at their screen that's right in front of them that tells you that this is your 20th stay. You know, yeah, they should they should actually be saying, I see this is your 20th stay. Welcome. Can I give you a free drink or, you know, right. You know, welcome. It's just, I don't even need something for free. Just welcome would be nice. I, I do. Um, I need lots of stuff for free in particular, <laughs> in particular water. I get offended when uh, I go to the rooms and they're trying to sell me uh, water for eight to 10 bo- bucks for a bottle. So uh, that, uh, that, yeah. that bothers me, but that's his topic for, uh, for, for another day. I didn't mean to uh, yep. get sidelined over yeah. there. Uh, Anthony, really, uh, really great point. Um, we're getting close to uh, having to wrap up now, but I do want to know uh-huh. um, what you think about that Marriott Hotel Rewards program being um, entirely uh, revamped, bringing in um, the Starwood component to it, bringing in the Ritz-Carlton component to it. Um, what do you think this means? Um, that, what does this symbolize going uh, forward in the future for both the brand, the customers, and other companies that might be looking to see what's going on? Yeah, so uh, this is also something very I was very passionate about. I was a very passionate Starwood um, you know, member. Uh, you're one not the only was... one. People say that that was the best one in the entire hospitality oh, business. I heard anecdotally, I heard that over and over and o- over again from people that traveled frequently. Oh, yeah. No, I, I was a part of the original team years and years ago when they introduced SPP. I wasn't the brains behind it, but I was a tiny part. Cool. So I felt very passionate about it. And I can tell you now, if you talk to any consultant, any management consultant, people who travel every day, um, they are Starwood loyalists. And I think when Starwood was taken over by Marriott, they were horrified that Marriott was going to change, um, yep. you know, the Starwood plan. And I think in this this new announcement I have, and it looks like from social media, people have been very impressed that Marriott has somehow found a way to maintain some of the best elements of both their programs. And, keep the Starwood people happy, keep the Marriott people happy, and combine them in a way that makes sense. I was a member of both. I was platinum on Marriott, gold on um, Starwood, and I kept on having to decide, like, right. well, should I stay in this Marriott? Should I stay in the Starwood? Now it doesn't matter, right? If I want to stay in the Sheraton or I want to stay in the courtyard, it doesn't matter for, to me. And so I think they've actually done a really good job. And um, look, it's not the most innovative plan out there, um, and and but they have 110 million members and so you don't want to get too innovative and start messing around you want to make sure everyone is happy first and maybe in two or three years they can start doing some other cool stuff but i think actually from my perspective i think they've actually for 110 million members and for big risk they've actually done a great job and they've made the benefits clearer they've made the points redemption clearer um you know you know what you're going to get and everything is sort of apples to apples now in, in the Marriott empire. So, yeah, in, in summary, I think uh, I've been very impressed at, at what they've done. Excellent. All right. So, uh, Anthony, before we uh, wrap up, I want to give you an opportunity for a good shameless plug. I learned a lot from you today. I'm sure other people are interested in finding you. Um, how do we find Red Sky Strategy? Well, the easiest is obviously to look online on redskystrategy.com. Um, as I said, we... You know, we work with people who are very serious about marketing, serious about branding. Well, you're working with uh, the Bermuda Tourism uh, Department right now. Bermuda Department of Tourism, I should say. But as, uh, the official name is Bermuda Tourism Authority. Okay. Um, and yeah, they're very serious about tourism because tourism is such an important part of their economy mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and, and an important jobs creator. And so we're working on a national tourism plan for them uh, for a five-year plan um, that is very interesting because we're not just looking at you know what's going on now. We have to look to the future. What's going to happen in five years? What should hotels look like? Mm-hmm. What should air transport look like? Uh, what should transport in on the island look like? Mm-hmm. Um, and so those are the projects we, we love to do. We love to do these sort of big, hairy, challenging projects, whether it's for a country or for a, um, a, you know, a brand of hotels or um, pretty much anyone, as I said, that's serious about marketing and serious about branding. Um, we love innovation. We love strategy. We love, you know, great brands that do amazing work um, in, in terms of how they are, you know, targeting people and how they are adapting to the new environment. Um, and obviously, um, hotels is something that, for me at least, is a, is a passion of mine. 
um, ever since I started working, you know, I was in, when I grew up in South Africa, my, one of my first jobs was working on Southern Sun Hotels, which was Saul Kersner's brand there, and he went on to do One and Only. Mm-hmm. Um, so that I would I got bitten by the hotel bug, and so it's definitely a one of my favorite top, uh, you know clients and topics to work on. Right, excellent. Be sure to check them out at RedSkyInsights.com. Anthony, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank all of you guys for listening. And I'll stay tuned because after the uh, commercial break, I've got another great interview. And no, I'm not sure which one is going to follow this, but I've been doing so many great interviews with uh, CEOs and major industry influencers. I'm excited to find out which one is going to be paired with this show, too. So I got to say, this has all been wonderful, but now I'm on my way. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after this commercial break. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No vacancy. The hospitality industry's number one podcast will be right back. Hey, I'm Glenn Hausman, and you know me from the No Vacancy Podcast, but I have got an all-new show coming, and I'm partnering up with the number one guy in hospitality, Mr. Anthony Melchiori. Now, it's called the yin and yang of hospitality. That's right. So I need to know going forward, because I'm a control freak, Am I yin or yang? I'm definitely the one that starts with Y, and you could be whichever one you want to be. I'll be the one that starts with Y. All right, so you're going to have more great banter just like this every single episode on the yin and yang of hospitality found wherever your favorite podcasts are available. Any final thoughts? Yes, I'm yang. All right, I'm yin. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. All right, and welcome back to No Vacancy Podcast with me, Glenn Hausman. I'm excited. I'm coming at you with the floor from the Gaylord National here at uh, Hoacon 2018. I'm stuck in this hot booth, uh, but it's sponsored by Red Roof, and I'm having a great time. And uh, I have someone here who's going to help me uh, sweat it out. Red Roof's one and only the president of the brand, Mr. Andy Alexander. How are you, sir? Uh, Very good, Glenn. Glad to be here. It's uh, really, uh, really exciting to have you here, and thank you so much for uh, sponsoring the booth. I appreciate it. I feel very much at home in this booth seeing red roof all over the place and and you know look we respect all our competitors in the market but having them in this room having to stare at red roof all day long we love it uh, yeah <laughs> i bet you do it's uh, it's really good and i must say um it was not well received by them which is exactly what you'd like that's, that's, that's what marketing <laughs> that's guerrilla marketing at its best right <laughs> it sure is yeah. and you guys are you guys have been doing a whole lot of changes and uh, you know at least i don't have to think too much i got so much red roof branding all over here i can kind of follow what's going on with the uh the entire company but to me the overall story is You've been really evolving over time, right? It, that to me is great. From a single brand to the plus to having the whole collection, I gotta, I gotta ask you, what's the strategy behind it? Why not just stay with one brand? Well, look, yeah, I, it really is an evolution of the brand, and the way we have evolved the brand has has been based on customer feedback. Mm-hmm. That's how we've always done everything we've done, from the product rollouts to the brand extensions. Uh, when we rolled out Red Roof Plus in 2013, we went and asked the customer, will you pay more to get more mm-hmm. in the economy segment? And they said, absolutely. And, and that's been a big success. Uh, we're past 60 properties in the Red Roof Plus uh, and, and very popular with the franchisees, both in terms of upgrading their current properties as well as bringing in new, the new Plus, plus properties. Uh, yeah, I really um, like the uh, the look and feel of those properties compared to what they used to be a number of, of years ago. It's um, it may be an economy hotel, maybe a budget hotel, but they don't feel like that. I feel like there's uh, everything in there. Um, it's modern, it's contemporary, it's a feel good environment. Yeah, the Red Roof Plus properties. I mean, if you look, if you review on TripAdvisor, Expedia, all those the sites in terms of the reviews, you constantly see. Well, why would I go anywhere else? Why mm-hmm. would I pay for an upscale brand when I can get this at an economy level price? That's upscale economy. You know, we that mm-hmm. is us. That's trademarked by right, us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the upscale economy branding is is what we're all about. 
And that evolution just has continued with the Red Collection. Yeah, the Red Collection is uh, just recently uh, announced. You've just been selling it since uh, February. We're recording this interview towards the end of March. So just two months. You already had one open. You've got another one uh, signed up. Uh, so that's uh, that's pretty exciting. Tell me a little bit about the Red Collection. Why go with this soft branding thing? Yeah, obviously everybody seems to be doing it. But why you guys? Well, again, this it, the same evolution occurred in this in the exact same way as the product rollout mm-hmm. and the brand extensions. We went back to the customer. We used Till and Knowlton. We went out and did extensive research on what the customer was looking for, and we asked them, "Do you need a mid scale or upper mid scale product in the center city, in the hearts of cities people love to visit, right. at a value price?" And the answer was, absolutely, we do. And you think, who needs that? Well, think about the millennials. We all talk about the millennials as, as what do they think, what do they want? Well, what we know they have is still not a lot of money. Well, I thought you were going to say student debt. <laughs> they, they probably yeah. do. They do. And so they need, they want to have that experiential experience. They want to have it in center cities, but they can't afford the the upper upscale and luxury pricing. And so to have an opportunity to be in that environment at a value pricing is what they were looking for. Interesting, Glenn, one of the things they said as we did the research, they don't like hip. They don't like trendy. You'd think that's the buzzwords of the day. That's not what they wanted. They wanted centrally located, value priced, and hip and trendy and downtown and urban are out and value priced and centrally located, walkable, those types of phrases are what it's in. What you're saying to me is kind of confirming what I hear all around is you want to be the entree to the experience of the city exactly. itself. And that's what's most important to these younger folks. And that's what we've been at Red Roof for our entire history. We're mm-hmm. not the experience. We're the means to the experience. But now we want to be, have that same approach in a center city uh, with a center city opportunity right. and obviously reg collection with an elevated uh, level of service and support can garner higher ADRs. What type of properties are the right fit to join the reg collection? Yeah, so um, properties that either already are or are willing to conform to their cities mm-hmm. and to give mm-hmm. that experiential um uh, that, feel yeah. to to the to the property and to the guest. So, for example, the the first one, uh, actually, both of these properties will be opening late summer, early far the fall. The first one, the St. Clair, mm-hmm. is on St. Clair, right near Michigan Avenue, in downtown Chicago. You can't get a better location. That's amazing. Um, and as they as that property is being essentially rebuilt from the studs up, um, it's being rebuilt with the windy Cindy windy city in mind and it's walkable to experiences to the magnificent mile but the rooms also have a have a uh, downtown feel to them have a have sort of the the hardwood floors like are traditional with red roof but then upgraded amenities and retiled subway tile bathrooms and things that you would expect in the city now you head to springfield illinois so that's where the second and our first Mm -hmm. franchise location will be the land of lincoln so you're talking mid-century decor types of things you would expect as you're heading into lincoln's birthplace right i i I love that and you know here's the thing that always that strikes me i hear all about these industry segments blah 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 right Mm -hmm. upscale upper scale upper mid scale you know mid 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 scale you know whatever whatever it might be i think that we get so caught up in those those terms we're not actually thinking of it how a customer buys the room at all right i don't think that they look at a uh, a red roof and go oh that's an economy not an upscale or an upper mid scale or the mid-mid-mid scale I'm thinking of. They're thinking of, am I getting a good value for my dollar? Exactly. They, it's, it is funny. And you talk to, we're so used to being entrenched in the industry and talking to industry people. And we use these terms, mid-scale, upper, mid-scale. And, and I've been using them here today already. Mm-hmm. But you go talk to your friends or your acquaintances outside of the industry, 
they don't know what you're talking about. They just know, is it a good value right. for, for what the product is? Right. That's why I'm always skeptical about all of these, uh, these mega companies that have, you know, 20, 30, 8 million different brands to it, that they're so slightly segmented, blah, blah, blah. But I, I, again, I don't think the customer is thinking of it in those particular terms. They just want a clean, comfortable place to stay that matches the, uh, the aesthetic that they enjoy being within. Yeah, they don't differentiate between those brands is that all the segmentation it's more about do they have a good experience mm-hmm. with that brand over and over again and when they do they'll connect emotionally to mm-hmm. it and they'll have that connection and they'll keep coming back and so yeah i don't think i agree with you i don't think it is all about trying to explain away how the segment is going to relate especially when you have 30 brands right how many different personalities can you possibly have right well um i I've got a, a friend who's got 47 different yeah. personalities, but he's under intensive therapy right. for, for that. Um, okay, so yeah, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. But still, you know, you're becoming, as more consolidation kind of happens, mm-hmm. it's, uh, you're becoming more of the, uh, the renegade, the outsider with um, yeah. having a small collection of brands. How does that in- enable you? And do you feel that, you know, it's holding you back at all? You know, it only holds us back with a very small segment of the franchise community. Mm-hmm. There are a few who just, look, ever, there's going to be some who think bigger is better, no matter what. And you can talk to them till you're blue in the face. But that's such a small segment, it's not really holding us back at all. Instead, what we're hearing is, and what we experience, is our high touch. We are a high touch company. If you are a franchisee for Red Roof, you are touched more, way many more times than you would from our competitor brands. All right, now but, I'm getting uncomfortable with all this touch. Yeah, touch. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, I guess in this world. Uh, touched in a little different yeah, way. In, right. this, in this case, touched with high, high yes, levels of exactly, service exactly. Uh, and operations support. Mm-hmm. And that's really the differential. And right. that is hard for brands that have thousands and thousands of hotels. At our size and experience, here I am. I've been I've spent now two days on the Ahoa floor. Right, and Look just around. to just to reset, we are here at the uh, the Ahoa Convention. In case right. people are tuning in in live, we're here at the Ahoa Convention, the Gaylord National Massive Trade Show floor. Absolutely huge. You've got a big booth over there. In addition to the one that you're sponsoring here. Yeah, no, and, and this is our Super Bowl. Right, I and mean, we view this as our Super Bowl. But regardless, every year I spend a couple days on the trade show floor. Mm -hmm. And that's because we're all about genuine relationships and real results. Right. That's what Red Roof is about. And we create those relationships by having the high touch, being being, um, in conversations with your franchisees, good right. or bad, comfortable or uncomfortable. Well, yeah. Here's the thing. Here, here's here's the thing. Sure, you you got to talk about that uncomfortable stuff. But if you don't address it, then you're really just allowing that sort of problem to to mushroom out of control. Better if be your franchise to be honest with you, so you could address the situation, or if necessary, make a course correction. And that happens all the time. Fortunately. Um, I think we're in the eight, mid 85% of our franchisees are not only just satisfied, but very satisfied with, with Red Roof and would recommend to a friend that they do a Red Roof. Right. And that's the word of mouth is when you get 6,000 potential franchisees under one location and the word of mouth is you should, you should be a Red Roof franchisee. That's a powerful experience. It certainly is. And here at the Aho event in particular, like you said, it's the Super Bowl uh, it's for our you Super because Bowl. this demographic really fits in with your hotel company. Ahoa members represent the vast majority of our ownership base, um, and we're thrilled that they do. Uh, they're, they're both appreciative and, and challenging at the same time, but they push us to be the best brand in the economy segment. And now as we expand, I- I- extend the best brand in the, both the mid-scale and maybe we say upper mid-scale, if, yeah. any, if anybody hey, knows what that is. We can say, we can say whatever we yes, want. We can. It, it doesn't really seem to, uh, to matter. Right. So, um, you know, I feel compelled. I got to ask you about that pipeline growth because I'd be a very, uh, very bad uh, broadcaster here if I didn't get those numbers from you. I mean, we're up to over 540 properties. And mm-hmm. Glenn, you and I have been talking yeah. for years and, and that number just keeps keeps growing every year last year we actually had a bit of a slower net growth 
And that was because, quite honestly, we moved a bunch of properties out of the brand. We still mm-hmm. saw 85 unit growth. That's great. Uh, but we, we dropped about half of those in terms of improving the quality of the brand. Um, this year, though, we'll, we'll move well over 600 properties. Wow. Um, and are just seeing uh, continued interest in the brand. Do you have um, a set number of properties that you look to get rid of, like bottom 5%, bottom 10% every year? How does that work in the decision-making process? Because I know you don't want to lose mm-hmm. any hotels, mm-hmm. but sometimes the hoteliers are putting you in a position where they're not doing what they have to do and kind of give you guys no choice. We don't look at a set number. Right. I think that I think that last year was closer to 10%. That mm-hmm. was a big number yeah. for us. But really, it was the the strong growth that allowed us to do that. Mm-hmm. And in the past, you know, there are a lot of brands you don't want to be net negative. And um, we had we've had three now four strong years of growth in the 70, 80 unit uh, level. So that allowed us to be a little bit more aggressive with some of the franchisees um, who really just. They show that they don't want to be part of the brand if they're not going to make the improvements, right. both in terms of quality and service. Right. So uh, how big do you think you could uh, get these these brands going? Well, you know, I think you know, there's plenty of green space for us. A thousand uh, mm-hmm. Red Roof Inns would not be unquestionable uh, I don't in think so. any regard. As you know, we've expanded into Brazil. Yep. Uh, we just, it's either this week or maybe early next week, we're announcing a Rio property. So that'll be our fourth Brazilian property. We have three in three properties in Japan. Um, let's just say lots of other representatives from many other countries are knocking on our right. door. We are, I like to say, Glenn, that we're the last girl at the dance without a date. <laughs> and everybody's coming to ask us, but we're right. waiting for the right partners, and right. we don't just dance with anybody. Right. No, I love it. I love that you have hotels in Japan. I'm dying to get over uh, there. And They're uh, nice. They're now, nice hotels. And now I know I'm going to stay uh, at Red Roof. All of this growth means that the company itself has got to grow, not just adding units, That's right. adding people, adding facilities. You guys are moving to a new office, aren't you? We are. We, we're upgrading our office space in terms of size and both in quality. So we'll still be in the Columbus area, but moving to New Albany, Ohio, which mm-hmm. is just outside of the Northeast. Right. And we're, we're upgrading our space to accommodate that continuing unit growth that we need to support at that high level of service and quality that the teams and franchisees expect. What's it like moving to a, to a new office and designing all of it? You know, it it, it is a lot of fun. And the, and the best thing is that we're really upgrading what our employees will receive in mm-hmm. terms of just job satisfaction, in terms of the product. Every desk will be ergonomic and will be up and down. You, know, you can raise your desk so you can stand. And oh, I love that. You can, you can sit uh, just for, for better health reasons. We have walking paths. I will say before you go on to the walking paths, yep. I have one of those desks at uh-huh. home and it makes such a big difference for me, right? Because in the morning and when I'm having my coffee, I like to sit down, but then to keep that energy up, I think it's really healthy to stand up and you know and just work that way. And especially when I do these kind of podcast yeah. interviews, I got to stand and kind of move around. Our, our employees are passionate mm-hmm. and they work hard. And we have to give back to them. So by giving them better workspaces, by providing them with, with walking, walking paths. paths, we're going to have bike share arrangements, uh, work on having gym uh, availability in nearby gyms, uh, just really providing a healthier environment for our employees to work out of. Uh, that's, a, that's a big initiative of mine and one that I find uh, you know, it's just crucial to the success of your company that right. you have employees who are healthy and happy. How do you uh, how do you keep um, ahead of the trends and keep sharp as a, as a president of a company to make sure that you're planning to make the right decisions and create the if, create the basis for you to get that inspiration in order to lead the company in the right direction? You know. I guess I would say, fortunately, one of the things about Red Roof is we are the most recognizable mm-hmm. small brand in the business. And, you know, even well, though I, some other brands have 10,000 properties. I think that people think you have 10,000 properties. They do. They do. And I think that um, being part of an underdog, in a sense, right. because we're the small guy that everybody knows. Right. 
just delivers the the, the mm -hmm. employees are infused with that we're gonna we're gonna overcome it and right. we're gonna win and that the red roof passion uh, that same passion you you know you see as as people come by the booth and th thinking that uh, you're a red roof employee and all that sort of thing we we just we just ooze that that red roof passion. So speaking of passion for red roof, do people actually like sign deals here, or is it just like, um, hey, let's let's chat next week? We signed more than a dozen deals last year, and I hope we we go well beyond that wow. this year. It's um, yeah, it's it's we, you know, most of those deals were already pre-discussed because you have to do the right disclosures yeah. and that sort of thing. Uh, but a lot to, like to have that face-to-face, -face, final closure, shake mm -hmm. the hand. It still is a people business. Right. I mean, you can do everything you want by email and voicemail and text, but getting face-to-face -face is how you get that deal done. Yeah. Um, so I want to know a little bit more about you. What was, that? what was the last movie that you saw? Oh, boy, the last movie. I haven't been going to uh, too many movies. Probably... Um, uh, that Winston Churchill movie was the, la the last, the yep. finest hour, the yeah, last hour, the darkest, the darkest, the darkest hour. hour. There you go. Um, but mostly, I'm spending my time. You know, my my two children have uh, now left the home mm -hmm. and are both in college. So I'm getting spending some time getting to know my wife again, which That's is nice. which is real nice. She's traveled with me. We've had some some great experiences recently on the road. Uh, throwing a lot of stuff out at home. Mm -hmm. um, and, first and, the children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not, yeah, first the children, and then there's stuff. So, yeah. uh, but it's it's been a whole new experience for me. You do you yeah. sort of uh, you have to re you know reset your life and and start looking for for new hobbies and things to do. So how do you do that? Because in four years from now, yeah. my kids are going to be headed off to college, and yeah. then all of a sudden, it's going to be really bizarrely quiet around there. It, it, I will tell you, it is it is bizarrely quiet. I think, um, you know, as I said, you can reinvest yourself in your work, mm -hmm. but seriously, what I've done is reinvest myself in my marriage. Right. And it's been a great experience. All of a sudden, you start doing things that you used to do before the kids existed, like traveling together, yeah. which is, which really is fantastic. And, and has, has just, you know, made, made our marriage one that's just more, we're more enthusiastic yeah. about it and about each other. So where, where have you gone recently? That was really super good. And yeah. what if they don't have a red roof there? What are you going to do? Sleep in a van? <laughs> so we, <laughs> Uh, we recently went to Enchantment Resort in mm -hmm. Sedona. Yep. Uh, we just came back from there on Sunday. I heard Sunday. that's going to be a new red collection. Uh, it, we, we would accept it. <laughs> yeah. I will tell you that. It was, it was unbelievable. And if you've experienced Sedona, it's, it's beautiful. And, and, and we had a great time out there. Uh, we did visit a couple red roofs along the way in mm -hmm. terms of stopping by. I'm, I'm, I don't, it's very rare that I drive past a red roof and don't go in. Right. Um, and had some good experiences talking to, in this case, two franchisees out in that area, uh, and they're um, they're loving the brand. That's great. Do you um, do you how do you rejuvenate yourself to make sure that you're you're sharp every single day in the office? Something I I seem to have trouble with. I seem to burn the candle at both ends. Yeah, I wish I could say that I do do that. I think it's more a weekend thing for me, and take the time to to step away for a little bit. Although I'm not a disconnected person, I'm not someone who needs to be disconnected uh, continuously. And so the recharging, I think, you know, that's a really good question. Maybe I should uh, think about that and <laughs> recharge a little bit. Because well, it's, it's, been, it's been a long summer. Yeah. I well, mean, spring. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Andy, I think um, we're going to have to, next time we get you on the show, find out how you saw your inner recharge there. All right. That, I'll work on that. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. So before, before we wrap up here, you know, I, I've, we've got all this great Red Roof branding in here, but I don't know how to find you. What if I want to uh, open a franchise with you guys? Well, you certainly uh, go to redrooffranchising.com. And you can see uh, what what your opportunities are there, or reach out to me. Even you can. Here's the trick about Red Roof. You know anybody who works at Red Roof, and you know their first initial and their last name. You just add at redroof.com. 
and you're in touch with them. That's excellent. I love that you're so easily uh, a- accessible. That's and what that's we one are. Of, that's one of the things that I've loved about having a relationship with you. I feel like I could just uh, drop you an email, call you on the phone. I don't have to go through 800 PR people in order to uh, even come close to talking to Anytime. you. Anytime. That's what Red Roof is all about. Genuine relationships and real results. And be sure to look out for that big Red Roof. In uh, It's already in your town or coming to a town near you as they strive to get to 1,000 hotels. I want to thank Andy Alexander for being here. Here, and I want to thank all of you for listening to the show each and every week. I hope you had fun. If you're watching this on the live stream, if you want to watch us on video and you're hearing the podcast version, go to NoVacancyNews.com. You can watch the, the video there. And make sure you subscribe to our newsletter. Text the word HOTEL to 66866 and you'll get subscribed. And if you're not subscribing to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play or anywhere podcasts are, please do it now. Thanks so much. And I'll be back next week. That is, unless I decide to go open up a red roof in Sedona. See you guys soon. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.